Okay, we're back. We're live in Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech, and we have a very interesting guest for you this afternoon. He's here in Honolulu, and he has just come back from China. He's Russell Liu. Russell Liu is a, uh, a lawyer, a Hawaii lawyer, who has been practicing and teaching in Beijing for at least a decade. He's going to tell you how long, and he's going to tell you what schools he's involved in. And we're going to talk about, guess what, the coronavirus. Russell, welcome to the show. I hope you're feeling okay. Jay, I'm alive and well, uh, hopefully knock on wood. Um, for the audience, again, um, um, I have been practicing law with a firm called Kingsfield Law Office with my office in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, and in Beijing. And I'm also teaching law, um, teach at the law school at the Beijing Foreign Studies University and also for Temple University's uh, BZ School of Law, and I teach at their law program at, on site in Beijing. And I've been in China for 16 years, Jay. Wow, sorry, I got the number wrong. It's, it only seems like yesterday. Uh, and right now you're broadcasting to us from Mary Noel, am I right? Yes, that's correct. I'm at the uh, Mary Noel School um, where um, they have an innovative Mandarin language immersion program. So. I've been discussing their program with them. Yeah. Needless to say, Russell is, uh, Russell is completely uh, conversant in Mandarin. So, Russell, um, you came back, but we need a snapshot of how it was for you, how it was over there, what you saw, what you heard, what you experienced, and how, and how you came back, because not everybody could come back. Um, so, very exciting time. So, tell us about your experiences over the past few days. Yes, Jay, it's been a very tense situation. It's been an ongoing process for me for the last two and a half weeks. I was here in Honolulu during the Christmas time. I flew back in early January for meetings in Hong Kong where I was there for a week. And then I flew to Beijing. You know, everything seemed to be normal. Um, I would get the update about the coronavirus. Um, but then after the first week in January, um, I think everything broke loose that uh, the coronavirus um, was a major concern, and in fact, my colleagues in other cities were telling me, um, for example, in Chengdu, that they had shut down the city. Um, and then I read about Wuhan being shut down, which means that the residents of, of, of these large Chinese cities, especially Wuhan, they cannot leave the city, uh, and you cannot enter the city. Everything's in total lockdown, for, and and. This is uh, something that I think only China can do. There's a lockdown of millions of people, 13 million people in, uh, in Wuhan. Wuhan is comparable, or it's actually three times the size larger than Chicago. So you can imagine um, what this lockdown is. Um, it's, 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 it's very nervous for many people. And this is happening during the Chinese New Year, which makes it even all a more tense situation because people um, usually this time of the year, are celebrating, going to parties, but that's not happening this year. Mm. A very tense situation, Jay. Mm. So when you say lockdown, you mean the uh, the military, the police are out there, and they don't let anybody come in or leave uh, Wuhan or the other cities that are locked down? Um, does it mean that if you're uh, you're trying to do that, you can't do it, and if you, if you persist, then you'll be arrested? Is that what it means? Well, not in that sense, Jay, but... Um, I'm in Beijing. I'll give you an example. Um, this has never happened in Beijing in all like 16 years. And what happens is every community, um, your living community, are actually shut down. There's a gate. For example, my community, um, you just can't leave. You have to bring your ID. Uh, you have to explain the reason, and you have they will log you in your your name and ID, time, and a phone number. And when you enter the premises, you have to show your ID. Uh, nobody gets access into the community. You have to have an ID, and you have to be shown on the log that you left. Mm -hmm. And this is really for control measures. They're trying to monitor very carefully um, if there are any potential breaches where there's an infection in the community so they can contain it very quickly. Um, the idea is uh, to uh, restrict the movement of people in the city. And, in fact, um, there's discussion in Beijing, at least that I've heard when I left a day ago, that – they're considering closing down public transportation, uh, which means the city will come to a total standstill. Uh, I was leaving Beijing. I was worried because for the last uh, few days, 
I actually had a flight J on a China Eastern flight from Beijing to Shanghai and then connecting on a direct flight from Shanghai to Honolulu. I hesitated and my friends advised me to cancel the flight, which I did, but it was nerve wracking for several nights. I, I was days I was trying to get on a different flight. I finally was successful to rebook a one-way ticket on ANA, which connects in Osaka, Japan, and then flies out to Honolulu. And it was a little nerve wracking, Jay, because um, several things. First of all, Beijing was considering shutting down the airports. At least I heard rumors about it being shut down. If it's shut down, I could not leave. I, w I was airport. worried for you, Russell. I was thinking about you, and I was worried for you. And, and, and thanks. I did have other friends like retired Judge Shackley Raffetto, who was emailing me, sending way chat messages, saying, Russell, get out of there. And so, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of concern. Uh, I've left a lot of friends back there. I've never seen that. It's the first time it's happened. Uh, I've seen other expats leaving, writing messages like, I've never seen this in 30 years. I'm leaving, and I feel like I'm abandoning the place. And it is a very different Beijing. I think there's some photos of what the street looks like. There's nobody there. Um, nobody is there. Um, and where are the they? Compounded. Where are they? If yeah. they're not there, if the streets yeah. are empty, where are they? Are they all hunkered down at home? And if they're hunkered down at home, how do they eat? How do they find yeah. water and food? That was my big question, Jay. Um, most of them are, are hunkered down in their homes. Uh, most people are not coming outside. This is a typical street, Jay. There's nobody there. It feels like a ghost town. Imagine 20 million people. Nobody's there. Where's everybody? Well, they're, they're at home, Jay. Um, this was taken a day ago before I left. Um, so um, the, understand the grocery stores are still open. People are afraid to go in there. Uh, you know, um, luckily for me, somebody gave a, a piece of, a huge piece of meat uh, as a gift for, for, for Chinese New Year, and I've been actually slowly cutting away at that and eating like ramen, dried ramen noodles, you know. <laughs> There's nothing to buy. Uh, but you have to do what you have to do, Jay. Uh, I was more worried about water because, you know, bother water. If I run out, that means I have to get water sources outside of my uh, mm -hmm. community where I live. Mm -hmm. But it was a little nerve-wracking, Jay, because I finally got my ticket. Uh, and then I learned or heard word that uh, other countries were, were actually shutting down and refusing to accept uh, anybody who, pa who passed through China or who originated from China. Uh, and I heard that there was consideration that that might happen in Japan, where I was catching a uh, flight uh, from the ANA to a Hawaiian Airlines back to Hawaii. So um, it's been a very tense situation, Jay. Did, did you did you uh, or did you meet any resistance when you landed in Japan? Did they stop you, uh, take your temperature? Uh, did they you know uh, inspect you there? And furthermore, uh, when you when you flew from uh, Osaka to Honolulu. Uh, did you run into any resistance there? Well, that's a very good question, Jay, but let me take you of how it's done. You know, I found that the facilities, the equipment, the monitoring was vastly better than in the U.S. When I'm leaving China, they have these checkpoints where they have this advanced equipment that monitors your body heat temperature as you walk through certain zones, and they actually check on you. And you have to fill out a, a declaration form, uh, who you are, your passport, your phone number, um, so that if there's a potential issue on these computer artificial intelligence uh, kind of equipment, they know what time you pass through the checkpoint. Okay, so we have this in China when you're leaving. It's not as though the China government says you're free, you can go. Um, they're monitoring so that if they suspect that you might have it, you are actually taken and pulled aside, and they won't let you go. Um, now, getting on the Japan side, um, similarly, when we arrived, if you were on a transfer flight, uh, I was in the transfer line. Um, you had to go to the checkpoint again, and they checked um, for uh, your temperature checks. And by the way, just to tell you, um, in my community where I live, they actually have guards at the front where you do a temperature check. You know, one of these temperature checks where they actually – We'll get that individual thermometer, put in your forehead, and they do a reading. And you can't go until that clears, and then they look at it. Um, and they actually monitor, and I think they actually may write down the temperature mm -hmm. of you going in and out. So it's a very careful process. Uh, what shocked me more, Jay, 
was when I was in transit at Yusaka Airport, I won't name the airline, but it's a local airline, uh, everybody in the hall, the Japanese, Chinese, and all the Asian travelers wore masks, you know, Jay, like this. Okay. Oh, okay. And, and it shocked me because the flight attendant, the crew attendants of this airline that flies out of white, white were not even wearing uh, uh, these at the lobby, at, at the Barker game. They were there for like 35 minutes, and I could hear people kind of like horrified that you're not taken seriously. Uh, and um, fast forward, when arriving in Honolulu, there's no ch equipment to check temperatures either. You know, and everything was more cavalier, you know, um, that it's not a big problem. So what, what happened uh, not, in Honolulu? Did they, did they inspect you at all on, uh, on, for health? Uh, did they ask you no, questions? They, did they do anything to examine you to see if you had a temperature or what? There was no inspection, no temperature check. It was like you just go on, walk your way from the gate to uh, the uh, immigration and homeland security. That was it. Ah, very interesting. And that's only yesterday, right? That's yesterday morning. Ha, huh, very interesting, very interesting. And, and so, slightly so, worrisome, because if somebody was on that flight originating in China, it'd be easy to find out. And, uh, you know, to protect the, the, the health of this community, there ought to be some kind of inspection, don't you think, retrospectively? I, I think so. And, and in fact, what, what horrified the passengers on this flight on Hawaiian Airlines coming from Osaka is that everyone wore masks. Yeah. And the flight crew didn't wear masks. They did it for a few minutes, took it off. It was, like, not comfortable. Uh, and when I flew the ANA flight from Beijing to, Tokyo, uh, to Osaka, the flight attendants wore masks all the way through. So there's a, there's a big perception issue that it's not being taken seriously uh and i think i think that that has to be looked into and i, I think that you know we should have equipment at our airport like in china and in japan where it, it's walking through um it will do a body scan of your temperature and all that yeah. uh so you get pulled out yeah well you know I, you what i've heard is that uh wearing a mask only part of the time doesn't work you have to wear it all the yeah. time, and that includes, uh, you know, you don't eat, and you don't take it off to scratch your nose. Uh, and furthermore, yeah. it has to be a certain kind of mask in order to prevent the virus from coming through the mask. Uh, so if, if they're taking them off and putting them on at random like that, uh, or if they're not using a mask that is, a, you know, a, a heavy mesh mask, whatever they call it, uh, they're, it's, it's like not wearing a mask at all. Yes, and, you know, I think it's a real cultural a gap in perception uh, because in I've been 16 years in China and Japan and China are very similar when somebody's sick they always wear a mask so that they won't get infected or spread it to somebody else and we don't do that in the US people get horrified when they see you wearing a mask but I think in this crisis especially if you're on a plane and every it's originating out of Asia I would think that it would be very wise for the flight crew to wear the mask yeah uh, and I, I really think that um, the airlines really should be penalized for this. Well, let me let me go to the, go to the word crisis. You use crisis, and indeed, a headline today was that the World Health Organization has designated coronavirus to be a uh, a global health emergency. Uh, the CDC in Atlanta has not done that yet. I'm I'm really not sure why, uh, but they differ. In any event, uh, I like your impressions because I know you've been thinking about this. How could you not think about this? Uh, it emerged while you were in China. You managed to find your way back home. Um, now you, you know, you're here thinking about what is happening and what you can do about it. So my, my first question on this is, uh, what's the status of the crisis? Uh, have you looked into it? Can you speak about it? Uh, not only in the uh, United States, but in the world. Well, I, I think a couple of things that really drives the, the point to, is, is that, first of all, um, I look at what the China government does. Okay? That tells me a lot. Um, what they say may be a little different from what is done. But when you do lockdowns of cities like Wuhan, 13 million plus, and you start to lock down other cities like Chengdu, uh, 
and Beijing has actually, when I left, um, they have actually restricted access to um, um, people coming in from different provinces into Beijing. And they're starting to do lockdowns of individual communities. That tells me that it's a real, it's a real crisis. Second of all, um, if we remember the SARS lesson, um, uh, at this point in time, um, this originated out of, uh, out of, uh, of ch a Chinese city versus SARS came out of Hong Kong. Uh, so the Chinese government is well aware um, that it needs to do um, drastic measures that have to be taken in place um, to prevent the transmission of the virus. So it's taken very seriously. And I, I think that what, what drives it is that today I believe the statistics now is that there's more people infected by this, confirmed cases, than there was in SARS. Uh, so that's, that's, that, that's a telling point that, that uh, why the World Health Organizations are now saying it's a global issue. You know, and the um, virus... Well, I think the other thing is factored into that, I think, is that uh, they, they've determined uh, by examining the vectors that... Um, the incubation period is longer than they thought. It's two weeks. That's a long time. And in the two weeks, even if you do not uh, present uh, symptoms, uh, you can pass it along to someone else. So if you're wandering around for two weeks not knowing you're sick and you're shaking hands and, and coughing uh, droplets on other people, you can infect a, a ton of other people. And they won't know they're sick for another two weeks. So you can see that how the geometry works on that. And I think yeah. that has to be involved in the analysis that the World Health Organization made. We're going to take a short break with Russell Liu. We'll be back in a moment. We're going to find out exactly what he's doing now in order to ameliorate the crisis from his point of view. This is Jay Fidel and ThinkTech. We'll be right back. Hey, hello, everyone, and welcome to the ThinkTech Hawaii studio. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii. We air here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Hawaii time, trying to bring you issues about security that you may not know, issues that can protect your family, protect yourself, protect our community, protect our, our companies, the folks we work with. Uh, please join us and I uh, hope you can um, maybe get a little different perspective on how to live a little safer. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Duration. You are watching Think Tech Hawaii. I will be hosting a show here every other Wednesday at 1 p.m. and we will be talking to a lot of experts and guests around sustainability, social justice, the future here in Hawaii, progressive politics, and a whole lot more. So please tune in and thank you for watching Think Tech Hawaii. Okay, we're back, we're live. I'm Jay Fidel, this is Think Tech. We're doing Community Matters today. And we're connecting with Russell Liu, who is a Hawaii lawyer practicing and teaching in Beijing. And it was just recently, yesterday, as a matter of fact, returned from Beijing. It was a harrowing experience. And he's here now, and he joins us uh, by Vimex call from uh, Mary Noel. Um, and we're going to talk about what Russell has been doing, even since his return only yesterday, to try to help the people in China, more specifically, uh, the people in Wuhan. So, Russell, you, you've, you've, you've started a number of initiatives only in one day. Can you talk about them? Sure. Um, we're reaching out to a lot of the American businesses who have interest in China, doing business there. Um, we're reaching out to uh, the large religious organizations and communities in the U.S. who have the manpower and support to mobilize. Uh, and one of the key things is also to uh, keep pushing the uh, interest of, of the American uh, businesses uh, to make them aware of the situation. And um, we have contacted a very large church organization, for example, and they are donating about 220,000 masks to China. Uh, we've spoken to one of the large um, pharmaceutical supply medical company. Um, and in fact, they are working on the, as we talk now, the, they're one of the lead companies um, trying to develop the actual medicine and vaccine to send to China to handle this situation crisis. And um, today at 3 a.m., I contacted my New York contact, 
uh, and it's very touching because they responded uh, within minutes. Um, the Jewish community to Yeshiva University, where I have contacts, and the dean of the law school, they're mobilizing now, uh, their alumni uh, in New York to, to figure out what, we, what they can do. Um, so we're getting the word out, which is the main thing. We just can't sit there and wait. Um, you know, the longer we wait and we start to say, well, for example, 3M is a large company, they should be doing something, you know, uh, we should wait on it. I don't think that that's the approach. We just need to get this out. Uh, people are dying. Uh, and the most important thing is the more they die, you know, the more um, the potential risk that that's going to happen here in the U.S. Yes. So if we can stop it in China, uh, we can stop that risk from going overseas. And that's important. And well, what, mo- what motivates you to do this, Russell? I mean, you're, you're back on the ground. My immediate reaction would be kissing the ground, happy to be back to uh, Hawaii and the U.S. And so my question is, why, why are you, you know, heading headlong into this now? Well, well, you know, this is something that's not a problem that's China's problem. This is a global problem. I work and live there for 16 years, and my home is here in Hawaii. And we just need to make sure we're in the same global community, okay? This is not a political issue. This is not a geopolitical issue. This is one of concern because today um, we really don't have borders except for the checkpoints when we when we land on uh, uh, country soil because things pass through easily because people travel we have the internet communication is worldwide so it's part of this realm that we live in unlike uh, you know 60 70 years ago when you didn't have the ability to travel you didn't have the internet um, so now that means it becomes part of our problems, and, and we have to take ownership of these problems, even if it's in a small way. But who knows? You know, if you don't ask, you get nothing, right? Yeah. So we're trying to push it out there so we can ask people, um, especially a lot of the lawyer expats who have great relationships with large companies. For example, uh, one of my relationships is um, I hired a, a lawyer to teach at our law school, American Lawyer. And his wife was the executive in China for a large company. So we got access really quickly up the chain to ask for help. And it was relieved that they're actually doing something uh, which uh, on this whole situation. So I think if we don't get anything and we hear people doing things, that's great. But we need to get the awareness because, you know, these companies that are in the U.S. are going to be aware, too, that we want to make sure it's our Problems also that it doesn't come to you. Right? Well, there, there seems to be a, a missing say. link, uh, Russell. You know, um, the, the CDC has uh, $85 million that it can spend immediately on uh, emergency um, medical situations just like this uh, epidemic. And uh, it has not declared an emergency, even though the World Health Organization has declared an emergency. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Senator Schumer. A couple of days ago, made made the uh, the point uh, that the administration, for reasons that are really not clear, has decided not to push that button, not to uh, release those funds, not to spend anything to deal with the uh, the crisis either here or in China. So, but you know, my my question to you: Isn't it better to have government step in? All the arrangements you're talking about, all the efforts and initiatives you've mentioned involve private organizations, private businesses, private individuals, such as yourself, trying to help um, and trying to stave off, a, you know, a, a pandemic. Um, but, but isn't it better to have the United States government do something? Uh, they have the resources, don't they? Of, of course, Jay, of course. Um, and, you know, I don't have all the information and knowledge of background what's um, going on in the communication between the governments and the U.S., all I know is that I just saw a video uh, of Vice President Pence who gave a speech that says, we're behind China. We are committed to helping China to uh, fight off this antivirus. So I would like to believe that something's been done. But in the meantime, again, sometimes maybe the low-level type of relationship, not the high political government relationship, can actually... Uh, mobilize uh, relief uh, faster. 
like for example, the church I talked about that's spending two hundred twenty thousand uh, masks yes. in China, um, things like that. That's mobilizing before the government uh, will do anything. I, there are reasons why, but I, I I don't know the political or the governmental relationship or communications. But I think that people are trying, and and you know collectively maybe. Um, that there's going to be a lot of private relief. Some yeah. people are saying, well, you're wasting your effort, you're wasting your time. Yeah. You know what? But when this happened, if this happened on our soil, I would do the same. And I would expect the Chinese to do the same. Well, Russell, one, one, last, one last thing before we, uh, before we break, and that is, uh, you know, you're here, you're back, you've been thinking about this, you're acting about it. Uh, not a lot of people in Hawaii, uh, individuals, or for that matter, Hawaii businesses, that are taking affirmative action. And I, I wonder if you could um, give us your thoughts and advice. What should the people in Hawaii do about this, if anything? What should the government of Hawaii do? Take a minute and tell us uh, your thoughts on that. Well, I don't think, Jay, it's a Hawaii problem. I think it's the U.S. perception of China. We don't know China. We don't know the language culture. It's sort of like us and them. We, we've been going to this trade war. And I think the most important thing is for us in Hawaii, we're supposed to be a very important travel destination a lot for people around the world. Okay? And we're bringing people here. So the risk is very real that somebody, one person, it all takes one person to come here flying uh, on a flight, and we may have a problem. You know, we may have cases here. That's all it takes. So, again, it's important. Um, also, from a global business perspective, uh, many of the things that are manufactured uh, for American companies, like Apple uh, products are assembled in China. And companies like this are going to be hurt, and that hurts our American economy. So, again, um, no. it is something where we're all connected globally. Indeed, again, indeed. Plus, it's plus going to affect plus. the economy. It is affecting the economy. And it's easy to see that going forward, unless this thing uh, burns itself out or we find a way to stop it, is going to have a profound effect on all of us, everyone. Anyway, Russell, I hope we can catch up with you again. Uh, I think you should stay in Hawaii for a while. And while you're here, we should speak to you at least a few more times uh, to find out how you're doing in your projects and find out how China is doing in, in its attempts to, uh, to deal with this, this epidemic. Thank you so much. Russell Liu, aloha. Thank you.